My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online, where we are in conversation with Anika Collier Navaroli. Anika, welcome to RightsCon. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> yes, it's pretty awesome to be in Costa Rica, too. Uh, the sunshine is, <laughs> is everything. Um, just some quick housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, post your questions online. I have my laptop open here. Um, you want to get on Slido. Um, to post your questions, and the earlier you post them, I actually start Q&A pretty early. So please do that. Um, now, just a few more notes about you, <laughs> introduction uh, for everyone. Anika is a fellow at Stanford University where she studies the impact of speech regulation on black content moderators and policy enforcers. Her expertise lies at the intersection of race, media, technology, law, and policy. She worked at Twitter where she was hired to help improve the company's content moderation. But in 2022, she became a whistleblower, providing testimony to the US Congressional Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the US Capitol. So I think maybe just for everyone, let's just start there. Yeah. Uh, could you tell those who didn't follow your testimony closely just the key points you disclosed about your experience at Twitter? Yeah, so I was one of the first people in, to come forward uh, who worked at Twitter during the Trump era, specifically who worked in content policy. Um, and so I worked there during some of the most momentous occasions in history and was a part of some of the biggest content moderation decisions in history and felt that it was really important um, for the public and for the record to reflect the truth of what happened, which was that my colleagues and I anticipated violence happening on January 6th for months and we warned leadership. We were begging to be able to do something and we were hamstrung by leadership. And it wasn't until the Capitol was breached that we were allowed to do something. And then two days later, when it looked like it was going to happen all over again, it wasn't until I went to bat and wrote a policy assessment and went to leadership and asked them if they wanted more blood on their hands that we were then able to permanently suspend the former president. Why do you think the leadership was so resistant to your warnings and your team's warnings? Is this unique to Twitter or is this something that actually a lot of big tech companies have the quality control team and it seems like generally there's a pattern of not listening to them until it's too late. I, I definitely think that that is a pattern, right? I think at every moment in history where something horrible has happened, if you look back, you can see that someone was always warning. Somebody was always saying that this was going to happen and the problem is industry-wide, right? What happened at Twitter is happening at every single social media company that currently exists. The exact same ingredients that led to January 6th and that led to political violence, the sort of you know, uh, hate speech, this harmful misinformation being included within political conversation leads us directly to political violence and it's happening everywhere. Um, just to double back a little bit about the fact that you did become a whistleblower, um, not enough gets discussed about what that process and experience is actually l like. Most of the time people are really focused, including journalists, on the information yeah. uh, you're, you're sharing that they forget about the tumult of your life. It must have turned your life upside down. It sure did. It sure did. I can't really overestimate how life-changing uh, whistleblowing is. Um, I definitely feel like I put my life in a blender <laughs> and shook it up, shook it up and um, I am very much still trying to figure out the pieces of, you know, what is this new normal that looks like for me? I think, you know, whistleblowing is one of the most isolating and lonely and terrifying experiences that I have ever been through. And it is not something that I, I take lightly when I say we need more whistleblowers. We need more people to come forward. We need folks who have worked in all of these tech companies who know exactly how these decisions were made to come forward. And I realize how big of an ask that is because of what I have gone through. And I realize that I honestly, I don't feel comfortable and in good conscience making that ask of folks because we need more resources to support whistleblowers as they come forward. We need safe spaces for them to be able to come and to talk and to share what they know. And you say there's not enough resources. What would you suggest that uh, organizations and governments 
if the governments are not the ones that the whistleblowers are uh, reporting on, um, could possibly do to support more sharing of information. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we are in a unique moment. And if I was a government agency that, or a, a regulator that was, you know, say at rights con mm -hmm. or in, in, involved and engaged in these conversations, you have an entire workforce of people who have been doing content moderation policy and enforcement for years who have just been laid off or who are facing some sort of insecurity in their jobs. Finding funding, hiring these folks, asking them questions, I think it would literally change the game. Let's back up a little bit about um, Twitter. Um, it, it sounded like you had a tough time when you were there and where Twitter stands today. What is the morality tale of where things stand and what do you have to say about social media in general? Yeah, so I think there's a really big emphasis on current Twitter and Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, really easy to tell ourselves the sort of fairy tale story of, you know, the big bad villain Elon Musk comes in and he huffed and he puffed and he blew down the perfect house that was Twitter, right? And I would really encourage folks to ask themselves that, you know, if the house was built so firmly and so strongly and the foundation was so strong, then how did it crumble so fast? I mean, the Musk era of Twitter, to me, really shows how important the content moderators were that he got rid of. Um, and I want to now talk and ask you a little bit about that job specifically. Mm. Um, I run around, you know, my head is always in circles in terms of how you would approach it, right? Where's the line between free speech and content moderation? That is, have, like, is there like, have you come up with a single sentence rule? I mean, did you have a list of like a checklist as you were making these decisions? I think it would, I think it would have been really easy if that's the case, but speech is hard, speech is messy. Speech depends upon who is communicating to whom, in what context, who the audience is, right? And so all of these things mattered. And one approach, uh, you know, so content moderation and folks who worked in my jobs, the, the things that we are told that we are supposed to do is balance free expression and safety. That's the job, right? And I think being in those jobs, one of the things that I was consistently asking was, you know, free expression for whom and safety for whom? Because inevitably, we were making those decisions and we were deciding that certain individuals' free expression reigned higher than the safety of other individuals. And that there were some folks whose safety was allowed to be thrown to the wind for the free expression of other folks to be able to be allowed. And my roles and a lot of the work that I was trying to do was bring in the ideas and the reality of power and thinking about how power works within speech and asking these questions and asking us to be cognizant of the decisions that we were making and readjusting that bias. Do you think it's possible to build a framework that everyone can follow? Because ultimately you have these teams, but it sounds like it's ad hoc. It's up to that individual making that decision. It absolutely is. I mean, I, I think, you know, there is self-regulation of social media companies hasn't worked. There has been way too much power in the hands of too few, and we have seen, you know, folks like myself and, you know, so many folks that I have worked with who have done their best, right? We, we have been faced with impossible odds, impossible ask, and we are just human beings, and we have, you know, an hour or so to make a decision and write up a recommendation, and we are literally doing our very best. And I think the entire system of relying on the, the whims and the, you know, the goodness of the hearts of a couple of individuals within a company doesn't work. Is this something that you think government should get involved in, in terms of requiring a certain number of quality control teams? I mean, that, that's what's crazy about social media, right? It's a kind of an unfinished product. It's an ongoing product. I mean, you, you wouldn't 
produce a, I mean, a car would have to be totally safe before you put it on the sh uh, floor to sell. Um, but with a lot of the technology that we're seeing, including also we can talk uh, in a few minutes about AI, it's, it's an unfinished product by definition. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot about the National Transportation and Safety Board and aviation, right? And the way that they have created these sort of basic standards of safety. And when there is a plane crash or when something goes horribly awry, they come in, they investigate, they ask what happened, and they determine how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again. But yet we have nothing like that within the social media world or that's governing internet service providers. And so we are at this point in which we have literally had a race to the bottom. And I very much believe that, you know, while the problem is huge, we have to start somewhere. And I think that we can start in a very easy space of what you're saying, right? Regulate safety standards. See if they make sure that companies have very basic safety standards, right? Do you, do you have a team? Are you using Google Translate in order to determine your content moderation decisions, or do you have native speakers for the languages and the places in which you operate, right? Very, very basic things that can be regulated. Yeah, you wouldn't sell a car, um, you wouldn't even try to sell a car in Malaysia if you didn't have people who spoke the local language, and yet you, you would have this with, with a lot of uh, tech startups and big tech companies as well. Can we expand this to also, um, Talk about regulation outside of the United States, mm -hmm. though. I mean, on countries where rule of law is perhaps less uh, strong, um, where regulation can become a weapon mm -hmm. to suppress. What do you think about that? How do you think about that? I think it's a double-edged sword, right? I think it, regulation is a tool and it very much depends on whose hands it is. Just like any tool, a tool can be used to fix something or a tool can be used to bludgeon, right? And so I think we, we, the fear of what could be or what might become, I think very much hinders us from doing anything at all. And I think we are at a place, especially in the United States, especially all over the world, we have to do something, right? And I think that that fear cannot allow us to not move forward. Do you think that um, the conversation with artificial intelligence and generative AI right now is sort of the kind of conversation you wish social media had uh, in the early days? And do you think this conversation that's happening right now is productive in that space? You know, I don't, I, in many ways, I see a kind of parallel to the conversation that's happening, right? You know, you see these, um, pronouncements by the individuals creating this technology that essentially says, we think this could be a really bad idea, but we're not gonna stop. Maybe someone should do something about it, right? And I think it's the same sort of reality within social media companies, right? We talked a little bit about how folks are always warning. When social media companies were being created and founded, people were saying, this is going to be a problem. You know, I wrote my master's thesis in 2013 entitled The Revolution Will Be Tweeted. And at that time, you had one of the very first um, coordinated campaigns being directed towards black women on Twitter, right? And so you have this, this nexus that has always been there. And you, you talk about warning and early warning, and this was the start of our conversation, but um, I wonder if you don't mind talking a little bit about this. Um, uh, yesterday, I spoke to Tim Gebru, um, who also echoed this, which is that part of the problem, the leadership is primarily white and male. Personally, as a reporter, uh, I, being, I remember being in rural uh, America and uh, covering the Bundy Ranch standoff, actually. And coming back from that and telling my editor, this is this thing is not going away. Yeah. And one of most of the editors just brushed it off, said, those are fringe people. What are you talking about? But the danger looks different from somebody who is non-white versus an editor who is. I mean, that's that's must have been part of your frustration. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think as, as a black queer woman who has studied speech and also been a target of hate speech, you know, I have this both lived experience, but I also have a deep understanding and knowledge of how these things work in theory. 
theory breaks down very quickly in practice. And I think one of the realities of the practice that you are talking about is, you know, whose voices get to be amplified, who gets to, you know, have the power within these situations. And so often it is the straight, cis, white American men who are the power holders, who are the decision makers. And I've also seen this very much within the tech accountability space, right? Who are the leaders in the trust and safety space and the tech policy space that whose voices are being amplified? And are they the same people who created the problems that we're fighting against now? What's also really fascinating is that, you know, these doomsday, these letters that everyone is signing about AI, if they were really serious, one wonders why not, you, why not quit? Why not stop doing what you're doing? Why not not be an artificial intelligence researcher? It's always, not doing it is always an option, right? <laughs> and it seems that some folks don't think that it is. And I, I think, you know, we, we see this, and I, I, I think this very much, again, goes to our lived experiences and the ability to realize that bad things can and do happen. It also isn't really convincing if they're warning us about something and then they're still on the job. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so, right, right. And I think just to, just to go back to the, the concept of AI and regulating AI, I think we have to, right? I, I'm, I'm for regulation. And I think one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, in this rush to regulate AI, how do we not forget about social media, right? How do we not decide social media is, you know, too big, too big to fail, too big of a problem that we can't fix. And so we're just going to move on to the next technology. We can create regulatory bodies who can walk and chew bubble gum, as we say in the South, right? Like, we can do both. And is this something that you are concerned about? You feel like this is happening? So much of the media attention is on artificial intelligence that people are no longer looking at the social media problem, oh, which oh, it is a global problem. Right? I mean, a AI is terrifying. Let's be, let's be very real about that, right? Again, I very much believe that we need to have regulation. And we have over 50 elections happening in over 50 countries just between now and next year. And every single one of those things is happening on social media, right? That is where the battlegrounds are happening. This is where the misinformation, the disinformation, the hate speech, the things that are going to impact not just our democracies, I, I literally call it the very fabric of our society is at stake here, right? And we have to rein that in and regulate it in a, in a tangible way, in a meaningful way before it's too late. Could you talk a little bit about that, those elections that uh, you probably oversaw on the content moderation team that were not elections in Europe or the United States? How bad is it in terms of the disinformation and misinformation campaigns? And where are these governments uh, learning how to do this? So I think, I think the Philippines is a really good example in a lot of the work that Maria Ressa and Rappler have done. I, I look a lot to you of what could happen in the United States, right? And so you have an intense disinformation campaign in which entire, you know, thought processes and entire stances on government and people was changed, right? And you see this you see folks who once lived under martial law and who were impacted by that now calling for the exact same thing to happen. And you ask, like, how could this happen, right? How could history be forgotten? How could history be rewritten? And it can be, and it can be done so quickly. And I saw that, you know, happening in the Philippines and you see how the rise to power of the Marcos has happened again, right? I couldn't and it believe reminds it me, happened. It reminds me so much of January 6th, right? In the United States and the sort of reality that we have not grappled with what happened in the United States on January 6th and the reality that there was an attempted overthrow of our government, right? And we haven't we haven't allowed that to be truth. We have allowed that to become misinformation for these individuals to be glorified in a way in which we are literally allowing truth to be rewritten about that event in a way that is dangerous. To what extent do you think technology has contributed to that in the sense that um, people see stuff on social media and it just feels abstract? Um, you know, in the old days when people had a newspaper, it somehow felt tangible and more real. 
Now I'm getting psychological, but you, you work in this world. So, yeah, yeah. So I was actually trained as a newspaper journalist. So, <laughs> you know, you I'm an old, old school newspaper in the hand, yeah. right? And I, I will say I, I'm, I miss it, right? I, I miss that sort of reality. And I think, you know, the, the instant news environment that we have become a part of in which we are literally inundated with information constantly, right? It's it very much not just information, but also outrage, right? These outrage machines that are constantly keeping us out of 10. Yeah. It becomes almost impossible to be able to discern a real crisis from what is not a real crisis when everything is a 10. Great. We have a question coming in, mm -hmm. so let me share that from John Stewart. I don't Hi, think that John Stewart, but maybe it is. <laughs> I don't know. What groups would you recommend to people who are thinking about whistleblowing and who are looking for support? Yeah, absolutely. So I have been working very closely with the Signals Network, and I would encourage anybody to reach out to them um, if they are thinking about whistleblowing. And I will also say, you know, outside of just, uh, you know, organizations and resources, I think reach out to your friends, reach out to your family. There is... Uh, a support network that is necessary um, and it is vital in order to be able to have have the wherewithal to continue to um, tell the truth and to blow the whistle in that way. And I would also very much say we we need more resources. We need funders. We need non-traditional sources of philanthropy to come into this world and also be able to support whistleblowers in ways that has not yet existed. And I know you've been going around with that message. Are you getting early reception to your message? Is it going down well with potential people with funding? <laughs> that's yeah. a that's a, a great a great question and I, you know, I have been I've spent so much of, of my time in this whistleblowing space and I, I said earlier, you know, in good conscience, I cannot ask folks to do what I have done, but I know that we cannot fix the solutions without that, right. right? And so, so much of the work that I want to continue to do is building those resources for those who come next, right? It is very much about creating a pipeline such that folks don't have to jump off a cliff and then figure out how to build the airplane as they're falling, right? Because what happens when you become a whistleblower? Your whole life changes. Like Income is an issue, right? You got to eat. You, so the, the bills don't, don't think of stop just because you blew the whistle, right? And, you know, I, I resigned from my job at Twitch. Um, I, and I, you know, been doing a fellowship at Stanford. And the reality is, is that, you know, you, I didn't know what was going to come next. I very much leapt off a cliff and, you know, have been figuring it out as I have gone along. And thankfully, I've had fantastic advisors, fantastic friends, fantastic folks who have been able, you know, to help me and guide me along the way. And it's still been free fall. Yeah, it's really tough. I think um, people then see your name in the press, you're getting a lot of attention. And somehow um, people think, oh, well, this whistleblower with so much attention paid to them, that equals money. But it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. I No, it does not work that way. And I think this really brings up the question of, you know, who is supported and who is listened to and who is believed, right? There were, you know, when I first came forward in Whistleblue, I did so anonymously. And I was, you know, my, my face was just hidden behind this kind of cartoon silhouette and my, my voice was distorted. And there were organizations and folks who came out in support of this anonymous whistleblower. Mm -hmm. And then when I came forward with my full identity, it was really interesting to me that some folks didn't continue to support and that folks were silent. And that within the Silicon Valley world and even in the tech accountability world, folks were more willing to support a cartoon robot than a black queer woman. And the other thing is, I mean, I don't want to um, uh, speak, I, I don't know your situation, but uh, something that's really practical that we all know is if you talk about the company you left, uh, other places are less likely to want to hire you, right? Like, that's just a reality. And this is something you have to live with the rest of your life. Anyone who Googles it, or Googles your name, right? Yeah, so I, I very much, I, are... I, I knew this going into it, and I think I'm having these realizations consistently as I, you know, figure out what my next path is going to be. And I, 
I knew that I was risking never being able to work in the technology industry again. Right? Which is something you love. It is. It it has been my entire life, right? Um, and the reality is, is you know, once once your job is dealing in secrets and you tell those secrets, people don't want to really trust you with secrets again, right? And I. I understand it. I get it. I completely understand. And I, I think the the question for me then becomes, how do I take this knowledge? How do I take all of this expertise that I have developed for almost 20 years and put it in, into some sort of format in which I am able to continue to have impact in the world and also do those things like pay my bills? Absolutely. Well, talking about uh, how to move forward, I want to ask you, um, Concerning the content moderation stuff, um, we've talked about the problems. Uh, how about the solutions? Um, do you think, I, I'm based in Berlin, I think the EU does a slightly better job yeah. than the United States, but where do you see leadership on this? Yeah, so I think the DSA is a wonderful model, right? I think the Digital Services Act, yeah. um, I, I think that the whole world is watching to see how it is implemented. And one of the biggest lessons I ever learned working in policy was that you can write down anything you want on a piece of paper and call it policy. You can make it sound beautiful. It can be great. If you cannot enforce it at scale, it does not matter, right? It is the implementation of policy and the operation, the operationalization. Well, that is not a word. <laughs> All of making it operational uh, that matters. Can, can you give me an example of what that actually means? Like yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I I was have been thinking a lot about you know the DSA and um, the European Media Freedom Act is is a big thing that's happening and there's a lot of you know votes happening around this right now. Mm -hmm. And when I you know saw a copy of it and, and read Article 17 in which you know. Uh, media institutions, media outlets were allowed to self-declare, um, I literally laughed, right? And I went around and I told all of my ex-colleagues, I was like, do you want to hear a joke, right? Like, let me tell you about this regulation and what is being planned, right? And it was literally, it's a situation in which I'm saying, you know, our, the fabric of our society is at stake and we are creating laughable solutions, right? Because we are not talking to the people who have done the work. We are not talking to the content moderators who literally could read the legislation and say, this is impossible, right? Like, this is literally impossible. So what you're saying is that the technocrats who are writing the legislation in whatever country, they're not talking to the people who will actually be enforcing and implementing. They are not, and I, I cannot stress enough that we will not be able to create solutions that actually work until we are all in a room. And I think one of the things that I have loved about RightsCon and why I'm so glad to be here is because we it's one of the first times that we've had that representation of all of the different stakeholders being in a room and being able to have these conversations. I think it has to continue. Again, if I, if I was a regulator, if I was anybody out there, if I was a civil society organization, if I was a funder, I would be thinking about how do I get all of these folks who have all of this expertise and no job right now to come help us fix this problem. Great. I'm just checking questions. People are pretty shy. So with our remaining time, um, let's end on a positive note. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Social media, where do you see exciting things happening, uh, whether it's a company or a product or innovation, and same thing with artificial intelligence? I still love technology, right? I think the ability to connect, the ability to communicate, the ability to build community like never before is still a very fascinating thing to me. And as I said earlier, these things are just tools, right? And it depends on whose hands it is, it, it is in. And I am encouraged that, you know, there is so much conversation and interest in regulating mm. and in getting us to a place in which there might be a better hands and better caretakers of this technology that is being developed at these great speeds. Well, on that note, Anika, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us in conversation. We'll see you at the next session. Stay engaged.